This is GPS, the global public square. Welcome to all of you in the United States and around the world. I'm Fareed Zakaria. Donald Trump claims we are winning the trade war with China. Thanks to my tariffs, we're taking in billions and billions of dollars from a country that never gave us 10 cents, China. But we are losing the more important battle, the education race against Asia in general. What can we learn from the East about education? I'll bring you the answers. Educators around the world have been waiting with bated breath for three years, and they will be able to exhale on Tuesday. That's when the latest round of PISA scores come out. Those are the global tests of 15-year-olds conducted by the OECD. They tell countries where their kids rank against others. And Asian nations have consistently outranked the United States in secondary education, math, science, and reading. So what is the East's special source? What can we learn from nations that consistently excel in education? Well, Tiru Clavel knows firsthand. She's an American, but when work brought her family to Tokyo, Hong Kong, and Shanghai, she put the kids in local public schools there. Now they're back in New York, and Tara has written a terrific book about what she learned from watching her kids learn. The book is called World Class, One Mother's Journey Halfway Around the Globe in Search of the Best Education for Her Children. Pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much, Fareed. Why is it that these schools, in, you know, these are public schools in Hong Kong and Shanghai, why are they teaching so well? I say the level of learning expectation is so much higher. Everybody has a can-do mindset, and yes, Learning is challenging, but through overcoming those challenges, you gain that resiliency and the motivation to continue to learn and push yourself. So that was, that, that's a very, very big difference. You also talk about the really important thing. Again, these are public schools. And what, you came back to the States and you were so struck by the wide disparities in funding. Um, but, you know, the, the best um, suburban schools might do very well, but the places where the poorest kids are, which need more attention actually get less funding here because of course funding is for schools is through property taxes so mm -hmm. and you don't have to see any of that in in hong kong shanghai and japan all teachers were paid the same they all had the same resources they really do everything they can to fight any kind of inequity so there are examples where we talk about in the united states we want the best teachers the most experienced teachers to go to those schools that may be weaker or underperforming but in effect, it, it's usually the regressive, the, the, the opposite, opposite. Yeah, yeah. where, well, I have tenure, I'm going to teach fifth grade in this school for the next 10 or 20 years. Um, where I can say one example is in Japan, um, when we were in Tokyo, for example, teachers are moved around within the district on every two to, every two to three years, basically. So you could go back to school and a teacher's not there and she was moved to another teacher. So you're not going to have, this is a good school in the district. This is the bad school because the teachers are constantly moving around. Um, and there are financial transfers to make sure that there, the inequity doesn't exist. In the United States, on average, only 10% of a school's budget comes from the federal government. So it's really up to districts and states to stem that inequity. And another thing that they do really well in Shanghai, for example, is they have kind of sister programs. So the higher performing schools take on a lesser performing school and take over its management to elevate it. You also talk about the, the respect that teachers had in these societies. Now that's something the government, I suppose, can't really do though. The teachers could be paid more, which I think is one of the tragedies in America. We, we think we pay teachers well, we don't. We pay them very badly. Yes. Um, what, what could one do about that? Because there really is that this difference, I think. So that reverence for teachers is really something that really smacks you kind of in the face when, you, when you're in Shanghai and in Japan. And on average, again, in Japan, for example, there are 200,000 applicants for 38,000 spots to become teachers. Uh, and it's as difficult to pass the bar, if not more difficult, in Japan to become a teacher. So the credentialing, the licensing is really, really difficult. And... What you also see is the teachers will do anything to help this next generation of students. So I tell many stories in the book where it would be 7 p.m. at night, and whenever the house phone rang, we knew it was a teacher who's teaching from, who was actually, I would just say, calling from the teacher collaboration room that all the teachers went to because so much of their time isn't spent necessarily in the classroom, 
but it's working together, collaborating through professional development uh, and lesson planning. And in the United States, teachers spend 27 hours a week on average in the classroom, whereas the average for OECD nations is 19 hours. So that's something that we have to address as well. So they're, t they're teaching too much and they're not spending enough time getting professionally enriched and developed. And Yes, and the other thing that happens both in Shanghai and in Japan is you have to be recredentialed every five to 10 years. And that requires hours and hours of professional development, observations, even medical tests. So it, it's like becoming a doctor or a lawyer, really, where you can't just pass an exam once. You have to keep up your professional development. Terry Clavel, pleasure to have you on. Thank you so very much.